It's time to take a step beyond. The podcast to inspire creativity and imagination. Here's your host, Dr. Anthony Poston. Thanks for tuning in to A Step Beyond. So as an educational psychologist, I can't help but observe human behavior. It's ingrained into me. Sometimes, though, if you just take the time, it's amazing what you can learn, not only by observing people, but other animals, too. For example, I used to have a beautiful Springer Spaniel named Sydney. After years of watching her, I suddenly realized that Sydney only ever did four things— Eat, play, poop, sleep, and never at the same time. And more importantly, she was happy and always present in the moment. I immediately became somehow aware that we all need to be like Sydney and simplify our extremely busy lives so we can better focus, be present in the moment, and ultimately be happy. Our guest today is also an observer of animals, primarily chimpanzees. And she's also learned a bunch from watching them. She's a professor of anthropology at Texas State University and a National Geographic explorer. She's conducted field work in Peru, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Kenya, and Senegal, and has been directing the Fungoli Savannah Chimpanzee Project. Ladies and gentlemen, the very observant Dr. Jill Prates. Jill, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Okay, so let's let's start off with a softball question here, and and, and, and an easy one, because many of our listeners may not know the difference. But it's an important distinction. What is the difference between a chimpanzee and a monkey? Oh, that's a great question. And the the dead giveaway is if it has a tail, then it's probably a monkey. Or if it doesn't have a tail, then it's an ape. So that that holds true for most of uh, the monkeys and apes that, that we have left today. Yeah, because every, I know a lot of people I know always use those words synonymously. You know, they they, they all think of them as all the same. Um, right. right. Right, Yes. And chimpanzees are only found in Africa, correct? Right. Today, chimpanzees are only found in sub-Saharan Africa, um, in the forest, but also in the savannas. Um, but they're really declining in numbers. And, and why is that? Mainly the reason that we see this big drop in chimpanzee numbers today is because of habitat destruction, but you still have um, hunting of chimps. In some places, people actually eat chimps as well as gorillas. And um, other reasons they might hunt them is they want to try to get a baby for the pet trade. And anytime you see any baby primate, whether it's a chimp or a monkey, usually the mother has had has been killed in order to get that baby. Um, and so those are some of the big threats. But probably today still some sort of habitat destruction, and that's, that's by humans, is the, mi- the main reason that, that chimpanzees and other primates are also threatened with extinction. Okay, so why primates? I mean, what in your early life and background led you to study these types of animals? Well, actually, I came to my primate studies in a, in a really roundabout way. I actually was an education major as an undergraduate at Texas State University, and I took um, an anthropology class. It was elective. I wanted to take a class with my uh, roommate, in fact, and so we found this anthropology cl- class, and I just kept taking anthropology classes. I was interested, actually, in archaeology initially, and I did field work, and I loved the field work, but I was not as interested in the questions um, that archaeologists look at and the subject matter. And so I pursued primatology because I also really enjoyed those classes. So I actually volunteered to work with chimpanzees, and then I got hired on. These are captive chimps. And it was kind of, I say, you know, that was uh, basically the the beginning of the end because other primates were ruined for me, and I, I just wanted to study chimps. Well, I know that I know that chimpanzees are probably most similar to humans, but don't we know more about chimpanzees than any other animal? I really think that we probably know more about chimps than any other uh, animal, not only because of captive studies, but of studies in the wild. So I don't think there's any other mammal that is as well studied as chimps, as well studied as chimps. And um, you know, we have upwards of twelve to fifteen long-term studies of chimps where they've been studied for at least a decade. And so, um, but remarkably, the more we study them, the more we find out that they're very diverse in terms of their behavior um, and other factors are as well. So it's, it's really pretty remarkable that we're not really closer to saying, you know, something about the typical chimp. I think 
the take home messages, there's no typical chimp, just like there isn't, you know, probably a typical person, that, that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, human beings are all very individual, but there, you know, there are behavioral similarities that you know, they, you know that you can kind of lump together. So, how, how long have you been studying humans? I mean, um, well, I study humans. <laughs> how long have you been studying chimps? Um, I first started studying chimps in the 19, in 1990 when I started working with captive chimps, and then I studied them on and off all through graduate school. But I study. I started my own project in Senegal in 2001. And I had done a survey there in the year 2000, but I really started this current project I'm working on in 2001, but it did take us about four years to get the chimps used to our presence. And so really, um, in terms of the, the very specific behavioral data, that started in 2005. So since 2005, we've been following the chimps um, almost every day from when they get up in the morning to when they go to sleep at night. And of course, I'm not always there, but I have a team that's always there taking taking data so for for a number of years now but it's interesting because even though um, my project is almost 17 years old we still have not been studying chimps there at Fongoli for a, f- a full chimpanzee generation okay so so take us take us uh, as, as naive listeners through how you observe and study chimpanzees in the wild well our um, our our protocol or our strategy, I guess you might say, is that we follow chimps from when they get up in the morning to when they go to sleep at night. And partly that's because they're very difficult to find if you lose them. And partly it's because for scientific reasons, we want to observe ideally a single subject all day long. And so we want to see what he he does, you know, over the course of a day. And we want long-term data on chimpanzees. They can live to be really old, even in the wild. We know now they can be they can live to be more than 50 years of age. But so we really want these long-term data on individuals, and we know the individuals vary. So we have a, um, a routine set up, and we have a list of subjects. And so we try to, you know, correspond to this list. So today I follow Mamadou, tomorrow I follow David, et cetera. And, of course, that's not always possible. But we really do try to keep with them all day long. So it is a really long, tiring day because they get up right around dawn, during the dry season, they may go to sleep at 8.30 at night after the sun has set. And so we're out minimum 13 hours a day with chimps. And then we're usually out 15 hours a day total. And if the chimps nest far from or make their bed far from our camp, then we might be out even longer. So it's not unusual for me to get home at 10 o'clock at night during the dry season. And then I may have to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and do it all over. So we usually go out for three or four days at one time and then someone else someone else relieves us and um they'll go out and 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 collect data and that sort of thing so it's pretty it's a pretty hard day but we get a really a lot of really good information that way so i i believe you said once that it took four years to get to the point where you could actually observe them talk about that for a second Right. So one of the big challenges I had when I first started my project was because these chimps live in a savanna, they're different in terms of their behavior, their ecology, and some of the challenges that go along with studying them. And there had not been a successful study to that date uh, that habituated chimps, which means just getting them used to your presence so you can follow them around. They're Ideally, they should ignore you, even though they always <laughs> they don't always ignore you. But ideally, that's your goal. And, um, you know, previous attempts had based their, had based their studies on what they had seen at Gombe with Jane Goodall, for example, but those early studies provision chimps. And so that's a way to get something used to you really fast is to feed them. We don't do that anymore because we know it can cause problems on a number of different levels. So we don't provision apes, but, um, with savanna chimps as well, what you see is not only do you have uh, the, the typical challenges of habituating apes, it usually takes about a year to get apes used to you, but then in a savanna, they have a different habitat, and so they usually just run away. They don't have really tall trees to take refuge in. It's hard for them to hide in trees like they might in a rainforest, and so they're just going to leave the area, and you really can't keep up with them if they don't want you to. The other thing about chimps is that you want to contact them repeatedly so they get used to you and they realize you're not a threat. And chimps have a fission-fusion social organization, which means that the whole group is not always together. And to habituate them, you want to contact the same individuals. And that's also hard um, with savanna chimps 
partly because of the fact that they have a very big home range as well. So whereas chimps at Gombe in Tanzania have a home range of about eight kilometers, at my study site, they have a home range of over 100 kilometers. So just finding the chimps in that home range is something that uh, you know takes a lot of effort. So it really was difficult. It took us about four years, but that was really probably quicker than I had anticipated. Okay, so how, how do they behave once they get used to you? Ideally, what you would like them to do is to completely ignore you, and a lot of what they do is ignore you. Um, there are different reactions, so... Usually what happens first is they're afraid and they flee the area, even in Senegal where they're not hunt, hunted for bush meat, for example, but they do engage in conflicts with people and, you know, people may chase them away from certain areas. So the chimps I study also live outside of a national park. And so they do live alongside people, as do most of the chimps in Senegal, in, Senegal, in fact. So they're afraid of people um, and they leave the area. And the next reaction, though, is once they start getting used to you, they usually display and they're somewhat aggressive. This is from a distance, of course. And then finally, they just kind of come to accept the fact that you're you're not going to hurt them and they let you follow them around. So at my site, for example, like I said, they live alongside people. They have, I, I usually say, for millennia, but they're used to us, but yet, but not yet to other people, which is the way we want to keep it. So... If someone comes out to see the chimps with us, you're fine by association. You know, they're not afraid of you. You can, as long as you stick with one of us, myself or a field assistant, the chimps are okay. But if you were to try to approach them on your own, then that that wouldn't be tolerated. They would immediately leave the area, probably give some warning calls. Um, But, yeah, there's sort of these different stages of habituation. But ideally, you want them to ignore you. What you don't want them to do is to involve you in their behaviors. And sometimes, you know, they do... Uh, they do do that, so you try to reduce the likelihood of that by keeping a certain distance from them. So my uh, approach distance is usually about 30 feet. I don't want to get 30 feet close, uh, you know, closer than 30 feet between myself and the chimpanzee. So I reduce the likelihood I'll affect their behavior, but I always say chimps don't read my protocol, and they may come closer. Kids especially want to play, and, and we don't do any of that. So we really try to have no interaction whatsoever. Well, I- I know you've worn masks before because they can catch our colds, right? Definitely. That's something that I think most people that study chimpanzees in the wild and and probably apes in general, at least where you have close distances between yourselves and apes, chimps and gorillas, is that we put on these surgical masks. And we do that when the chimps are closer than 10 meters or about 30 feet because they definitely can catch uh, things from us, especially, for example, if we come from the United States and we bring in some sort of virus, that the has not you know been in the area before that's something that could very easily turn into a more serious illness for chimps because they don't have immunity and so a cold for example can easily turn into pneumonia for young chimps especially so anytime we're closer than 10 meters and that is uh not infrequently the case because chimps will come closer they have they're not afraid of us anymore so they'll walk close to us and if we can't move away um easily without affecting their behavior, then we'll put on a surgical mask, wait for them to walk by or slowly move away, um, try to ex- try to extricate ourselves from the, you know, the social group or what have you. But yeah, we definitely wear um, surgical masks. And that's, I think, especially important for people like myself that travel a lot and come from overseas. So with my Senegalese field assistants, they also wear masks, but I'm less worried about what they may introduce to the chimps, only because people and chimps have been living there together for a very long time. So, okay, so you've been watching and observing chimps for a very long time. What are some of the biggest influences on their behavior? One thing that strikes me about chimps is that they're very social. So they're really, you know, you can't have a chimp that is not social, really. I think that's one of the most important parts of their life. Uh, They really, though they are affected by human presence, so where I work in Senegal, we've seen over the past decade especially a gold rush. And that's affected their behavior as well. And so they've really, you know, shifted their ranging behavior, for example, the way that they're vigilant around people. They're used to certain people in their environment. And so they're used to, like, you know, women walking to the field or people using a footpath. But when people come in and start doing new things like mining, then they they change their behavior. They're very vigilant. They monitor what people do. But um, so, so it depends on, you know, the different types of behavior, I guess, But in a typical chimpanzee society where you don't have an influence of, say, predators or or humans to worry about, the 
biggest overarching sort of, you know, in your face sort of behavior is sociality. I mean, it's just um, almost unthinkable to think of some of these adult males that my in my group that once they fall from the alpha position, they're ostracized and they're kind of kicked out of the group. It's really difficult to think about them living by themselves because that is, you know, one of the sort of worst situations a chimpanzee could be in because they are such a social animal. Okay, so... You know, I've heard you speak, and I've and I've heard you talk about how the chimps use tools. So get into the tool use aspect because I, I believe this is how humans were once defined, and that doesn't hold true anymore. Right. So we did you know, once define our own species as you know where we use tools, and then Jane Goodall discovered in the '60s, and we had known other animals even before that used tools, but she very famously observed a chimpanzee using a piece of grass or twig to fish for termites, and that really changed the way Western science viewed not only chimpanzees but humans. And so we're constantly in the search for that defining, you know, feature of our our own species. And as an anthropologist, I think it's really interesting, but I I like to come at it from the point of view of the chimps in that, um, you know, it seems like we're always kind of breaking down these definitions. And another definition we had until fairly recently was that, well, we may not be the only animal that uses tools, but we're the only animal that uses tools to hunt other animals. And at my site in around 2005, we actually observed the chimpanzees exhibiting that behavior as well. So that's probably been the most exciting discovery to come out of my site. And they use these tools to hunt other primates or tiny little bush babies that try to sleep in tree holes during the day. And so the chimps may be, make these fairly crude stick tools to stab down in their to get at the bush babies. But that, again, is something that, you know, we had used to define our own species and uh, something that is really regularly seen at at my site in Senegal. It's a pretty seasonal event. We see it every summer. And they use other types of tools as well. They termite fish like uh, chimpanzees do elsewhere, including at Jane Goodall's site. They use tools to dip for ants. They use stone tools to crack open hard fruit. So, it really is something that's routine for chimps. About two-thirds of their days are characterized by some sort of tool use. So it's not that it's a rare event. Um, and it's, yeah, we really rethink, we've rethought our ideas of what it means to use tools. There are other primates that we know use tools as well. But it's, it's something that, that's just, I would say, crucial to a chimpanzee's survival as well as a human. Yeah, because yeah, you, you talked about how they how they not only hunt using tools, but they also are willing to share the meat with each other because they are a social group, correct? Yeah, the meat sharing behavior is really interesting to me, and it's something that you see at sites throughout Sub-Saharan Africa where chimps hunt, and they do hunt at most sites, not all of them, but most of them. And it's pretty remarkable because uh, regardless of what chimps you're studying, they seem to really prefer meat, but they don't include a lot of it in their diet. So at Fongoli, it's less than 5%. I think at most sites, it's less than 10%. So not a huge part of their diet, but it seems like it is really a highly preferred food source. So if anybody captures some sort of mammalian prey, um, you know, there are a number of chimps that are there waiting for their share. And it's really interesting because at my site, not only can we watch to see how chimps share monkeys, and that's been predominantly a male activity, and it's also the case at Fungoli as well that, you know, males will capture monkeys and then they'll share meat with other individuals. But because the females at Fungoli also hunt, and they, they're the ones that hunt predominantly with tools, we also see how they share meat. And they're sharing this pretty small food item. These little bush babies are about the size of maybe a large guinea pig, and a female could easily eat it by herself, but she does share. So that's something that we're investigating now. I think it's really reflective of their very tight social structure. You know, social cohesion is strong. And so it's uh, really fascinating because in many ways they don't fit sort of the predictions that you would make about chimpanzees and sharing behavior. You know, I, I saw a video you showed once that I laughed at because it showed how the females were far more um, precise and vigilant about using the tools to hunt with than the males were. <laughs> that they were actually better hunters, you know. I mean, you know, in, in human terms, you know, the males were always the hunter gatherers, you know. And uh, but in this case, the females are doing a better job. Right. It's de- it was really surprising. So that I, yeah, that behavior was surprising in and of itself because it was using tools to hunt. But then the fact that it's predominantly females exhibiting the behavior was was pretty shocking. And then following from that, the fact that females 
share their prey species. But I think part of that is that not only do you have females exhibiting a certain behavior, but the males also have to exhibit some sort of tolerance. So in chimps, like in other primates, you have males that are bigger than females, they're stronger than females, and they're dominant. And at other chimp sites, what you see is oftentimes the alpha male especially will steal someone's prey item when they capture it. So the incentive to hunt wouldn't be there for somebody like a female that's smaller and who is likely to have her prey stolen. So at Fongoli, part of it is also that males are tolerant. So there's this sort of a sense of ownership, or at least how we'd say it if we were talking about humans, this, this respect for ownership. And so, so um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting, the whole sort of um, behavioral syndrome is interesting and there's it's more complicated than, than I once thought. There are a number of different subtle details but still to this day it's kind of funny to watch to see how females exhibit the behavior compared to males. Um, and one thing that I'm going to be able to do now is to follow, for example, the offspring of a really prolific female hunter to see how they learn the behavior. And one of the things that we, I find especially interesting, too, is that while young males exhibit this behavior, hunting with tools, it kind of falls off sharply when they get to be adolescents. And I have a feeling that it's related to their focus on the dominance hierarchy and social behavior. So they never seem to, to actually get to that. They don't seem to fine-tune that behavior. So that's why they look kind of brutish when they're just, you know, using a stick and pounding it down into this cavity, whereas females are, yeah, they look to be much more precise. Um, and so there's some social aspects to, to that behavior as well. Okay, so in all your studies and observations, what's the most surprising thing you've observed? Oh, my goodness. That's a good question. Um, one of the most surprising things that we see, I think, is that chimps really love water at Fongoli. And it makes sense because it's so hot and incredibly hot and humid around the end of May when the rain starts. So the heat index will be literally over 125. It's just really hot and humid. And so the chimps will compete over these water sources. And for a human, I think that makes sense. I mean, we all want to be sitting there in the water when it's so hot, but that's something that you just don't see in other chimps. So it, it may sound like it's not too exciting, but that's probably one of the most amazing, unexpected things that I've seen. But I feel like at Fongoli, there's so many, um, you know, the hunting with tools that is always really fascinating to me, despite the fact that we've seen over 500 cases of that so far. But um, probably the, the water use is one of the most, the oddest things as far as chimps go. That's something that's out of the ordinary. Well, well, they have to drink a lot too, right? Yeah, so the chimps at Fongoli are really limited by water, and it's it's something that doesn't isn't necessarily the case for chimps elsewhere. They can get a lot of their water from fruit, but these guys are really driven by their water sources, so their ranging behavior revolves around these water sources. They have to drink every day during the late dry season, and especially if a female is lactating, there's no way she can even skip a day without drinking. So that's something that really drives their behavior, and that's significantly different from chimps elsewhere that live in forests where you don't have to worry about even the high temperatures, but this, you know, the lack of water that you see at Fungoli. You know, when I, when I think about the most surprising thing that I, I heard from you or what you showed me was when you talked about how the chimps don't like snakes whatsoever, and you showed a, <laughs> you showed a video of this chimp throwing these rocks at snakes and, and a python that was in the in, in the brush there. But what surprised me, and I guess I've always heard this, but I never really I never really thought about it, was they were picking up these big boulders. I mean, it wasn't like it wasn't like these little tiny you know hand rocks that you as a human you know that we're whipping at things. This was like a boulder, and it was like whipping it over there like like you know like it was a little pebble. Right. Yes. Well, and that's the thing too. It's you. You kind of. It's hard to appreciate. I think because how strong they are. So people usually say chimps are about five times stronger than humans. They're probably a little stronger than that when they get really worked up. But it's hard to measure the strength. Um, but that's something. Fortunately, the chimps don't know how strong they are. So every once in a while, you know, the alpha male, especially, used to kind of include me in his dominance displays, and I would just have to stand up, you know, and kind of shoo him off or something but fortunately they don't they don't know that they're a lot stronger than we are but the it's it's pretty remarkable sometimes so there's that reminds me of uh there's one really big male he's the biggest male in the group group we call him Juff, 
and he is mid-ranking those. So the guys that work for me are always just, you know, trying to think of reasons to explain why he's mid-ranking because he seems like he should be the alpha male. But there's a lot more to it than just brute strength as far as being the alpha goes. But I've seen him do these displays, and he'll pull over a small tree like it was nothing. And I'm, I'm just thankful that he, a couple times I've reacted to that. And it's, of course, not directed at me. It's directed at other chimps. But the fact that he does that so easily is pretty astounding. Um, but it, you, br- you bring up the snakes, and that's something we're working on now, too. So we've got, I just tallied this up the other day, we've got over 61 encounters with dangerous an- uh, reptiles. And then what I did was tease apart these individual encounters. So I have like two, over 200 cases where we have, say, Dawson. He's the one that, that throws rocks at snakes. So Dawson's encounters with snakes. And it's really interesting. They don't really react to non-dangerous snakes. So they'll react to pythons and then to venomous snakes and other snakes they seem to ignore. But it's really interesting. And I think if, if they were humans, you would definitely describe some of these chimps as being, uh, you know, Phobic in terms of snakes because they they basically take a weapon, either rocks or sticks, and they attack the snakes every time. And then the other really interesting thing is when someone gives a snake an alarm call, all of the chimps have to come look at the snake, which to me is very reminiscent of what you see in humans. I've seen it in monkeys as well, but once they see the snake, they move on. But I've seen a female there that had bad sight in one eye, and she walked around this area for several minutes until she finally got a view of the snake, and then she left and followed the rest of the group. So to me, that's a very human-like behavior. Well, you know, I go back to my dog examples. You know, you look at dogs. It always seems like the smallest dog can be the most vicious. They have no idea of size. You know, they, they have no context of, of relationship. And so, yeah, I, I can understand how, how they may not realize that they're five times stronger. And, and it's a good, a good thing that they, that they don't with you standing there. But <laughs> Right, definitely. I always, yeah, say, and that's part of our protocol is we don't have any interaction we don't want the chums to ever realize how strong they are because, yeah, that'll be kind of the beginning of the end. Well, yeah, because I'm sure one of those chicks probably just pick you up and whip you across the field. So, all right. So, <laughs> for so, sure. So, so tell me, what's it like to be in Africa for extended periods of time? I mean, tell us about the conditions you deal with and paint us a mental picture. Gosh. Um, it's really, I if, if I had to really describe it really simply, I would say it's like very rough camping. But we do live in a village. We basically live like other people live in the village. But it's um, very rustic for most people, and so we don't have any modern amenities. We do. I did put a well in in the village when I started my project, and they didn't have a well before. They were getting water from the creek, and it was whenever I tested, it was always contaminated, and I, I had to have good re- uh, drinking water, of course, for students and myself. We have we live in huts, um, but it's usually too hot to sleep in the huts, and they're what we would call adobe huts with the thatched grass thatched roof. And so we usually bring our beds outside. They're made out of bamboo. Um, and so we sleep outside with mosquito nets rigged up that way. Uh, another good reason to sleep outside is that snakes like to sleep inside. And so we have a lot of mice around our, uh, our camp like most other ha- dwellings do. And so you'll often find cobras inside the hut. So that's another reason we like to sleep outside. But it's um, it, pretty basic. We have a shower that's just like a bucket shower, so you'll pull up water from the well, and then you'll use a bucket to take a shower. Um, we have a long drop toilet, so just basically a hole in the ground. And we do have some solar lighting and enough solar power that we can charge cell phones because there are places in the, in the area now that get a cell phone signal. And um, we're actually pretty close to town, so within 20 to 30 minutes of a town that has modern amenities now, it didn't when I started the project, but because of the gold boom, mining boom, there's been a lot of uh, changes in that town. So, um, yeah, so it's uh, basically more like rustic camping than anything. Well, you also talk about how hot it was. Um, I, I don't do heat well. I mean, I, I'm actually going to Vegas in a couple of weeks, and I know it's going to be 100-plus degrees there, so I'm, I'm not looking forward to that very much. Um, you know, it's my understanding that you have actually eaten what the chimps have eaten, right, the termites and the ants. Talk talk about that. I mean, most of what they've eaten, um, I've had some a couple – I've had a couple of really bad termites, so I am also a very bad termite fisher. But if I use the chimp's tools, I can usually get at some. 
Um, the thing about ants is you have to eat them really fast or else they tend to bite you on the inside of your mouth. So, yeah, I've basically eaten almost everything they've eaten. I haven't eaten raw meat, so that's where I kind of draw the line. Yeah, no bush babies? Yeah, no bush babies yet, I have to say. Okay, so what what's the scariest situation you've ever been in? Um, probably the scariest situation has been with snakes. So because we're out before it gets light and after the sun has set, we often encounter snakes. Um, and so I, I definitely, you know, a couple of times had close calls with puff adders, which are a venomous snake. And, um, you know, I think I passed within inches of one puff adder and it, it hissed at me and I didn't see it until I heard the hiss and I turned around and there it was. And then another time, I guess I set my backpack down right next to one and so it was kind of reared up ready to strike but so i do worry about snakes um especially because i'm out by myself and so spitting cobras um could be problematic that's probably the scariest in- encounters that i've what's that been, i've that i've had what's been the most amazing oh gosh well in 2009 we had a chimp that was kidnapped uh poached and so we were able to confiscate her, and within five days we were able, ex- able to actually return her to her mother. So I carried her back to the group, and we put her down, and um, the chimps came and got her. So that was probably the most amazing thing I think that's ever happened to me. Okay, so what are your goals and plans going forward? I mean, I, I, know, I know you're going back to Senegal here soon, so. Yeah, um, we're now looking at a lot of uh, behavior-related thermal regulation. So we have a heat imaging camera, and that's something that's, that I think is interesting because chimps live in the savanna where they haven't been studied before. But then also because of climate change, we've seen um, a lot of variation in temperature. It's been hotter, so it's hot enough there. But, you know, with these high temperatures now and the heat sticking around for longer, it dries up the water sources. So there's some real conservation concern as well. So I'm really focusing on thermal regulation, hopefully over the next couple of years, to try to understand, you know, the limits that apes are at, at in these habitats. You know, I know, I know that uh, you've overcome some. Uh, I'm not sure if diversity is a word, um, but you've overcome some some uh, some issues with people who were kind of naysayers to uh, what you were doing, basically telling you that you could not do certain things and so on and so forth. So, what what is the best advice you have ever received? Gosh, I guess um, perseverance basically is is what I think <laughs> has worked best for me. Um, you know, not giving up, I guess, when maybe other people would have. But I had great professors in college that, you know, said I needed to be more assertive and just get out there and ask if people need, even though there's not a position, you know, listed, ask if, if they're looking for somebody. And so that worked for me in a, in a number of different scenarios. And it kind of had a snowball effect. And I think the other really that I learned early on was experience. Um which lets you know whether or not you even like doing something. But then once you have experience, that really is something that snowballs. And that's crucial for field studies where you have to deal with a lot of things, not just, you know, the chimps, which are amazing, but hard conditions. And then you need to work with people, actually, um, a lot more than most people probably would like to, at least from ecologists. And so experience, I think, is really key. That's something I earned, I learned early on and something that really helped me out. Well, Jill, I appreciate you chatting with me today. Let me ask the show by asking you this. Your story is, in fact, one of perseverance and determination. As many people I know told you, you couldn't do what you are doing today. What message would you like to leave with people to help inspire them to rise above the naysayers and follow their passions? I guess what I would say would be, yeah, not to give up. Don't let people tell you that you can't do something, um, even though it, you know most people may agree with them. I would say that if you're really keen on doing something, at least try your best. Um, and, you know, I, I think it definitely works out in, in many cases. So I, I would say don't give up. Don't listen to the naysayers or the haters or whatever you want to call them uh, these days. Well, the haters. Well, thanks, Jill. I do appreciate it again for your taking taking the time to talk with me. And thank all of you for listening and taking a step beyond with this. We're so busy every day 
it's very easy to forget that everything is somehow connected to everything else on our planet. And because of this connectedness, it's more important than ever to understand not only our role as humans, but also the roles of all other living creatures. It's called context, and it matters to everything from our personal lives to families to business and to governments. The more we observe and better understand context, like how Jill has dedicated her life to observing and understanding one particular piece of it, the more efficient and effective we'll be in trying to live and thrive within it. I hope you'll continue to listen to A Step Beyond and become inspired to be the very best version of yourself. I'm your host, Anthony Postian. Follow your dreams. Thanks for listening to A Step Beyond. Take a moment, if you would, and leave a review on iTunes and share the podcast with those who need to be inspired to become more creative and imaginative in everything they do. 